Hello and welcome to 21st Century Vitalism, a podcast asking the question, what does it take to cultivate vitality in the 21st century? I'm your host, Brett Kane, and today we're going to be answering that question by diving into Buddhism. Helping me with that is a renowned master meditation teacher, David Nickturn. You may have heard of David from his numerous podcast episodes on the Duncan Trussell Family Hour or his time on Pete Holmes' You Made It Weird. But believe it or not, David has actually been in the meditation world for over 40 years after he studied under the legendary Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche. As one of the first generation Americans to really receive these beautiful teachings, David has gone on to teach thousands of students all across the world, while somehow still managing to continue his life as a musician. Having been nominated for multiple Grammys and actually winning an Emmy, David has been featured in the New York Times, Fox News, Fox News and Netflix's The Midnight Gospel. He's also the author of two wonderful and impactful books, Awakening from the Daydream, as well as his newest, creativity, spirituality, and making a book. He's easily one of the most influential teachers I've encountered in my life, so this has actually been a huge treat for me to be able to spend this time with him and pick his brain on how we can bring these teachings and practices into our busy lives. I really wanted to use this time as an introduction to some of the basic principles of Buddhism, but also explore how we can incorporate these teachings into a contemporary framework while still respecting the ancient roots. As a graduate of his mindfulness meditation teacher training, I can personally attest to his effectiveness in translating these ancient traditions into an accessible and very workable part of our modern lives. Buddhism has since taken the crown as my navigation system through the world of spirituality, and what I think inspires me most about it is that you don't really need to be a Buddhist to benefit from the principles and tools it equips you with. The practices we look at and talk about here are really meant for humans everywhere, of all backgrounds and belief systems, and that to me is the radical kind of practice that we need to genuinely transform the world. We're talking about the science of how to have a mind <laughs> and cultivate compassion and generosity and equanimity. Um, these are very important things that are rich to any culture of any time. So I'm really glad David was able to step in and help me introduce this topic. This is something we're going to be touching in and out of as the show continues, because like I said, it, it's been really inspiring and useful for me. So I think in the question of like, how do we cultivate vitality? I think a part of that is how do we manage our minds? How do we relate to our minds, our thoughts? This is what Buddhism seeks to answer. So if you want to keep in touch with David's work, head on over to davidnickturn.com, see all of his upcoming events, and book your own one-on-one -on -one meditation training session. He's also going to be starting up another round of mindfulness meditation teacher training courses starting here April 7th. So be sure to check that out if you're interested in going a little bit deeper. As always, if you want to support this show, head on over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us expand the scope of the show and continue to bring in excellent guests such as David. You can also follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook. Subscribing to YouTube actually is probably the most direct way to stay up to date on the newest episodes since uh, it bypasses the algorithmic nonsense of the other social medias. You get the moment I upload a video, you get the little bell and you're, you're plugged in. So we are on every other streaming platform as well from Spotify to Apple Podcasts. So um, yeah, just uh, plug in any channel that you wish. Uh, there's usually a rating or uh, suggestion kind of thing. So, you know, help us out and, uh, you know, you will get good favor in return. Um, also, another thing is that if you do want to really take a step into the meditation world. I'm also a teacher as well. Uh, like I said, I did learn from David. So email me at 21stCenturyVitalism at gmail.com and we can start that. We can do it virtually. If you're in the Grand Rapids area, we can meet in person. I also am a licensed massage therapist. So that doubles that email. If you want to reach out to me for body work, just let me know and I can get you in the books and we could start working together and take a lot of the principles we talk about in the show and actually apply it to your life. That's what it's for. So otherwise, sit back, open your hearts, drink some tea, do some stretches, and welcome David Nickturn. David Nickturn, hello and welcome to 21st Century Vitalism. How are we today? Thank you, Brett. And uh, I'm happy to be here with you. And everything's so far okay. You know, that's how we do it, right? Yeah, that's all we can. So far, so good. All we can ask for. Um, well, for the understanding of the listeners, I just 
uh, completed your 100-hour mindfulness meditation teacher training that you offered virtually. And I just wanted to start off by saying that I think the program was really great. I was really surprised at what you were able to accomplish in a virtual space in terms of the transmission of the the teaching. You know, there's the, the oral aspect of it that um, I think actually carried across really well. So um, big ups for the uh, the navigating this weird time we're in. Thank you. And we have another one coming up. If we can mention it later on, for those folks who might want to join in, that'd be great. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll have a yeah. bunch of links at the end too. So Beautiful. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I also, I wanted to start this off. I, I was really thinking about it. Now, you know, I have a little bit of your time here and like so many directions I can take this. And I think for the sake of the listeners, um, starting at like the absolute basic, and this might be a little nebulous, but I wanted to really ask you, um, what exactly is Buddhism? A lot of people come to me and they, they think it's a religion, they think it's this or that, and I just think there's a lot of misunderstanding that clarifying might really be of uh, benefit. Well, you know, I have a sister named Judy. My big sister's named Judy, and I said, oh, you started Judaism, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Buddhism is named after Buddha. And so to look at Buddhism, you got to look at what Buddha means. And Buddha is not a proper name. That's an important thing. It's not like Fred or Brett or Dave. Um, it means awakened, uh, awakened one. And such, uh, such a thing is also considered to be actually connected with our own inherent possibilities, our own inherent nature. So you could say there's a version of Brett Buddha and David Buddha. Um, the, um, kind of full ripening of somebody's potential, um, which is already there. So Buddha is just somebody who realized, in a way, a human being who realized their full potential of awakening. Uh, this particular Buddha, there are many Buddhas, by the way, throughout time and space, so there's not just like one and that's it. But Shakyamuni Buddha, who's the one who the current ism is uh, sort of riding on, lived about 2,600 years ago and was born in an area that would probably be closest to Nepal now. Uh, so northern India and um, you know what he was a householder originally it's an interesting thing he wasn't born on a lotus or you know out of a sort of magical way he was um, depending on who you listen to there are sort of some the origin story there are some kind of magical imprints there but mostly it's a human being who lived um, in a family situation and then became a dropout a yogi I mean so in a way you could tell that story um, right now, and in, in fact, I'm actually writing a musical right now that's sort of a modern person mirroring the, the, the journey of the Buddha. And he dropped out and then he wanted to kind of get <clears throat> closer to uh, figuring out what is really going on with this particular life that we're inhabiting. And interestingly enough, many people in my generation did similar things. <laughs> and they studied yoga and they studied this and they studied that and they tried to uh, explore reality so um, in a way he's an archetype also he's a real person who lived in a particular time but he's also archetypical of that kind of sense of exploration and journey and 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 realization mm -hmm. when you say the ism part I'm sorry Brett just yeah, to finish that thought because you asked about ism the ism part is how to do what he did that, that makes it into an ism if I just do something and then I don't tell you how to do it, and then it's just David. But if I tell you how to do it, it's Davidism. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. So when you say things like awakening, a, a lot of people, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if like a lot of people have the proper contextualization. A lot of people might yeah. hear that and be like, well, what do you mean? Like, I am awake. I'm here listening to what you're saying. I'm driving uh, my car. Like, what are people awakening from, and why is it in... Uh, the Buddha's context important to do that work? Yeah, great question and elegantly put. Um, and when you mention somebody driving a car, I had the immediate uh, thought of like, we think we're awake when we're driving a car, but anybody who drives a lot knows that you have moments where you go, oh my God, I'm driving a big, heavy vehicle at, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour. Haven't we all had those moments where you just kind of come to a, a kind of more uh, present kind of state of awareness rather than just uh, meandering through time and space with your imagination which is what we do most of the day and it's, it's why i wrote a book called awakening from the daydream 
we think we're awake, but we're really daydreaming quite a bit of the time. So um, it's c coming fully to your senses, fully to the present awareness. That would be what we mean by that. And also developing a real relationship with that aspect of our existence, which is less imaginary, more kind of um, direct, direct experience. Okay. That's what I mean by it anyhow. Yeah. So what was it that drew you originally to this path? Um, the mm -hmm. listeners might not know, like you were one of the, uh, the first generation Westerners to actually start learning and teaching these, uh, these methods and practices. When you were young, David, learning about mm -hmm. this from your teacher, what was it that you drew you to this? Like, was it already kind of an inclination in your family or like Eastern yeah. spirituality? Like, how did that, how did this come apart to be such an important part of your life? Yeah, great question. Um, well, as my friend Krishnadas says, I was born Jewish on my parents' side. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was raised in a kind of fairly progressive uh, New York family. My, my dad was a, a pediatrician and a child psychiatrist. My mom was uh, actually, at, at her midlife line, she became a very successful theatrical producer in New York. So she was a business person and artist. Um, a lot of, lot of uh, creativity in my family and a lot of healing kind of energies and so forth. So <clears throat> I always had a slight inclination towards Asian uh, culture. That manifested pretty early. I was you know, listening to Japanese imperial court music when I was 15 along with uh, John Coltrane and kind of mm -hmm. avant-garde jazz. Um, and then you know, I remember going down to Chinatown and I saw this movie in a theater in Chinatown in New York called A, a Touch of Zen. And these, at the beginning of the movie, these kind of saffron robed monks floated down from the trees and then started kung fuing everybody in sight. <laughs> and I just went like, sign me up. <laughs> so I always had a little bit of an inclination in that direction. And I, I got into yoga and stuff like that, which was, you know, all trending pretty heavily right about that time. I'm talking about around nine, 1970. And and then I, my teacher came to the yoga studio, and my teacher was Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, uh, Tibetan uh, meditation uh, master, and I thought, wow, this has got to be cool. Uh, it was a cool factor, and I just um, checked it out, and, and the rest is, uh, you know, ensued from there. Wow. Yeah, I think the the barometer of coolness is a, honestly like a really authentic and intuitive sense that a lot of people should really be leaning into more. Like the things that your flavor or you're attracted to, it's like there is something in that, you know. It's hmm. glad to hear that that was, that was a part of it. Yeah, I think that's how we operate, right? We kind of get a glimpse out of the corner of our eye of something and it sort of got sparkles a little bit. Of course, then you could just go from one of those to the next and never really get into anything. So mm -hmm. that's the that's the negative. The downside of cool is that, um, you know, th this is trending, that's trending. But, you know, can you stick with it after it finishes trending? Because it might still have some depth and authenticity that you haven't explored yet. Right. And I think that that's kind of a downside of a lot of the spiritual aspirants of this current generation is like, mm. I know the term spiritual materialism, which your teacher uh, mm. t originally said, I believe. Right. And, you know, like the idea that you're just kind of shopping around, but you're not really like settling in anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I, you think your your generation is prone to that? I think so. Yeah. Um, Attention least, span kind of issues? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it has to do with like lining up with the way technology is also wiring our brain. Um, mm -hmm. Or also just like, I feel like we might have a drought of a lot of authentic teachers, at least from my mm -hmm. perspective. I don't know if it's because I just wasn't ready for a teacher until now, but... I, that's actually something I wanted to ask you was, do, do you, th are you, when you look at the future of Buddhism in the West, do you think that it might be in danger because we, the, the line is kind of getting severed from Tibet or? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a great question how I happen to be somewhat a little bit extra of a student of the migratory patterns of Buddhism because, uh, through no fault of my own is <laughs> the way I like to say it. I end up teaching in Japan quite a lot and I have a, a whole sangha of, of students and uh, we've trained with that same teacher training program you've taken about 150 people have graduated from that in Japan mm. so how does something go from one culture to the next and uh, you know in general like there's let's say you use the analogy of a cup of tea there's the cup and then there's the tea 
uh, the cup it being the culture that holds the teachings changes. It does. I mean, we even have different kinds of cups here than they do literally uh, in Japan. It has a handle on it. Um, so uh, the container is going to shift, but is the essence the same? And I think you'd have to go say uh, yes, that if you're talking about Buddha, the essence, as long as you're talking about human beings on this planet, you know, let's just limit our conversation to that. I don't know what people on other planets with five eyes and, you know, what their version of Buddhism would be. But here, for human being uh, archetype, I think the essence is the same, actually. Mm -hmm. Shockingly so. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, I mean, doubling back to, like, the idea of, like, the teacher and transmission, do you think that we're poised to really carry this torch effectively? Like, we have some of the same teachings, but the methods that I've learned, I mean, you know, you're actually the first teacher that I've interacted with, and that has already shown me so much about my process, but a lot of people don't have access to that or don't know yeah. where to find it. Yeah. Well, you got levels, you got tiers, you know, it's just like any kind of experience, it unfolds as you get into it. Uh, you know, if you're a chess player, you might start like playing at home and then you go to the park and there's some old guy there sitting in the park and he's playing 20 games at once. And then you start reading books about it and then you go in deeper and then you realize there's different levels of mastery uh, about that. So I think most things unfold in that, in that way, sequentially. What has happened is that the general idea of meditation, particularly mindfulness, has hit the mainstream in the West. Most people have... So 30 years ago, people had no idea what you're even referring to. But most people have said, oh yeah, meditation is this, or I, my friend meditates, or, you know. Um, and through apps like Calm and Headspace, a lot of people get just simply exposed to the idea of, um, you know, there's this great uh, Tibetan teacher named Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche. He has some wonderful books out, and he's a really good teacher. And he says, take the three pills, and it's um, silence, um, stillness and spaciousness. Mm. How's that for a prescription for a culture? Yeah. You know, and so could anybody understand those ideas? I think they're very simple ideas. Now, the apps get people at least tasting that. For example, on Calm, they have a TV ad that just has this circle. Have you seen that? And it just says, do nothing for the next 20 seconds. And it's a natural forest and it's raining and there's no other messaging coming through. There's just this loop of... of uh, showing you the 20 seconds passing and everybody in who's watching that is getting a kind of transmission in a way it's very clever because they are just being pulled into the notion of silence uh, spaciousness and stillness for the length of a commercial yeah so the idea is getting implanted and my theory is that um and the what the reason i'm building out our dharma moon platform is i think people are going to want to go deeper maybe not necessarily going into the kind of um, very traditional way of going deeper. So uh, I think the American system is going to uh, have a little more of a secular vibe to it. That's just our culture. Um, and then we're not as ritualistic and we're not as prone to those kind of things. But I think there'll be a deeper iteration and I think it's completely possible and um, but not inevitable, but possible for the most profound aspects of the Buddhist tradition to, to flourish in the West. Otherwise, I would not uh, be doing what I'm doing. Wow. I think it's completely possible. Yeah. So you don't think that the loss of ritual or um, that tradition, you don't think that that's going to be um, kind of a hindrance to people? Or cause I, I personally think that actually, like, I do like the ritualistic aspect and I see the function it serves. But I think in taking these practices and really bringing it to the day to day, I think that, like you said, like that is honestly, for me, it feels a little bit deeper even. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The householder practice is very deep, actually. The householder practice is either very deep or very superficial. Mm -hmm. Because if you recognize the sacredness of everyday life, you're in a way into the most progressed part of the Buddhist training is not how to do it in a monastic or ritual setting, it's how to do it in everyday life. That is, that's the advanced course. Um, but of course the ritual can support that. It can also become its own whole realm. Mm -hmm. You know, you go into a, a monastic situation, classical monastic situation, you come out of there, you know, you, you didn't necessarily learn how to make your bed or 
uh, you know, get a job or, or uh, you know, get your car uh, taken to the shop. Um, so I think the ritual will shape itself as the understanding deepens. That's what usually happens. And a bunch of Westerners pretending to be Tibetan or pretending to be Japanese and following the outer prescriptions, that could be helpful for a while because at least there's a container there of something that communicates the sort of idea, uh, the essence of it. But at some point, it would be nice for us to develop our own culture with it, with some of the same markers, but in our own terms. And that is what's happened with Buddhism all over the world. Japanese Buddhism looks nothing like Tibetan Buddhism. Right, right. So would you encourage folks who are on the path to kind of maybe have a little bit of creative freedom with how they bring these things into their lives? Like, where is that, like, balance between respecting <laughs> the tradition, but also, like, we are yeah. a different society and we have different, we can't go off in a cave and meditate for 40 years. <laughs> no, but you could go to a cabin in the woods and meditate for a week, and that's going to be part of it. So, and some people will do deep practice. That's going to evolve, I think, over time. Um, but, uh, yes, there should be a certain respect for the authentic tradition. You should learn that first. So, I'm going to use a music analogy. Everybody knows I'm a musician, you know, uh, in my everyday life. Or if they don't, now they do. <laughs> um, and, um, like, I remember going up to Woodstock, and s there was always some... Uh, uh, musicians in the square there back in the day and they're kind of just pl blowing free jazz we call it they're just like making kind of whatever and the principle is freedom I can just play whatever I want what's the difference but they never learned the tune they never learned the uh, the tune so the great jazz musicians they always learn the tune first and then that, that from there there's a certain amount of freedom so I would say learn the tune learn the tradition that you're studying go deeply into it have a lot of respect for it and don't be just necessarily thinking it's um, that there's something inherent in the ritual um, that is uh, going to protect protect the inner essence of the tradition necessarily. You have to you have to you have to map to that also. And then once you have some kind of feeling of essence of what is being communicated, and that could take some real training. I think you can create your own forms. All these forms that we have were created, mm. not a single one flower arranging, a tea ceremony, um, you know, um, Zen archery, um, calligraphy, they were all created. Uh, so, um, you know, all those uh, style of the Tibetan monastery is a creation of the human, the human world. Uh, so it'll be interesting to contemplate how, how it could evolve in the West. Um, but I think the transition generation, like our generation, in, including you, uh, your generation, has to really soak itself in the traditional forms at a certain point. Yeah. It, yeah, it, that's a great question, but Yeah. Um, it, it really does kind of feel like we're torchbearers, and that was kind of uh, what I felt like when I was taking your uh, meditation teacher training. I think you used the analogy of uh, grandma's recipe for bread, and that yeah. like every generation has to kind of like make their own essentially it's like you have the recipe but there are things you can do to really present it as yourself and be authentic and I, I think that's actually what i like the most about buddhism is that it really puts you front and center it's not there's the teachings but it's like how you interact with the teachings and it kind of like invites you into the long now of this entire history from 2600 years ago you know and it's yeah. you feel like you're a participant in it you know, and breathing life into it, and it's breathing life into you. And The long now, I like that, Brett. Yeah, yeah. The long now, that's a good title. Yeah, I, uh, I'm glad you feel that way about it. Um, probably some people feel like, oh, who cares about all that, and what's the purpose of tradition? But those are the same people who study music, and they don't ever learn, you know, where it came from. Yeah. Or art, and, you know, it is, as you're saying, both. You have to kind of learn the tradition and then and then you have more freedom to express yourself at that point in a, in a creative way so i guess we believe i believe in discipline and freedom being kind of going together yeah yeah i i don't remember who i heard that from but it was like the same sentiment that in order to be truly free you have to have the discipline otherwise yeah. you're just kind of going in all these directions and you don't really have any agency over what you're doing really because you don't know yeah. any better you know it's good brett you're making me feel good 
Good. saying this stuff because you know you can't really plant these ideas in people's minds they think you're lecturing to them or something but it feels like it's coming from a very uh, kind of considered and genuine place in your own journey um and, and that's um that's refreshing and you know we're passing it along i'm you know what i'm doing i'm passing this along uh i don't expect to be around um you know i was going to say for that much longer but who know you know i would say that differs between tomorrow and 20 years but still like you know your generation coming up is my main focus actually well, okay yeah I, I i've got like um a real jones for um the millennial and even the next one i have a granddaughter who's three and i look at them and i go wow they're gonna really have a tough run yeah on this planet yeah and so whatever tools we can pass along and the main tool is the mind how you hold your mind is the main tool that you have in this life Everything else is going to blow off at some point. You might, you know, uh, recognize that um, circumstances can be challenging. Uh, you could run out of money. You could run out of resources. But the resourcefulness of the mind is, is really your, your main uh, resource in this life, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Which is, I mean, the essential crux of, you know, Buddhist thought, you know. So for the people who haven't really been exposed to a lot of these kind of philosophies and practices, what do you think is the most essential groundwork that they can start at to where they don't need to like go be a Buddhist, but like the one gem that they can take from this conversation? Like, what do you, what do you think, you know, in working with yeah, the mind? Just learn about mindfulness meditation for starters. So some people think that's the whole arc of the Buddhist t tradition. So it's 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 healthy to say no, that's a foundational uh, premise. But it's everybody should start there. If you cannot bring your mind to one point, if you can't bring your mind to the present awareness, if you can't develop some kind of softness and friendliness towards your own process, it's going to be everything else is going to wobble. So I, I sometimes refer to mindfulness as like a tripod that you build, and stabilizing kind of practice then on that you can put the camera which is developing inside awareness you know good you know overall picture of situation so that's the camera's kind of like more of the awareness piece mm. <laughs> so everybody needs a good tripod yeah. get yourself a cushion yeah start meditating there's lots of ways to learn about it yeah and you know i mean that's even what you kind of hammered in your most recent book uh the creativity spirituality and making a buck um, for everybody listening, like I really strongly suggest it. I got it like the first week it was out. And mm. the way that you, you brought in those principles of mindfulness and then applied it to every step of like creating a business, I, I just think a lot of people don't realize that this is such a contemporary thing. You know, it's, I think, as popular as it is for a reason, you know, and seeing how it's like influenced you and your uh, your entire platform. I just think that you know, people really don't realize how fundamental of a tool this is. It's kind of similar to like brushing your teeth. At least that's how I feel as I started it. Good for you. I mean, good because you're, I call it mental floss sometimes. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're developing a, a very core uh, foundational habit, which is, you know, we have good habits, we have bad habits, you know, but habit means you repeat it. And uh, mindfulness is, as far as I can tell, if you get clear instructions, is a is a really strong foundational habit. Now, one of the things you remember from the teacher training is we said your job as a teacher is to, first of all, magnetize people to thinking they might want to try it. So that you can do anything you want. You can go out in front of your your uh, your apartment there and, and with a hula hoop and, uh, you know, and, and dance around and who are you what are you doing oh well i'm teaching meditation inside here you should come in magnetizing is you know just uh, the art of bringing people towards looking at this and the second thing is giving clear instructions and that's where you know that's was the emphasis of our teacher training program can you give clear instructions to somebody else which means you understand it yourself and the third thing is just encouraging people to do it yeah. you know sort of uh and then they do it it's not something you can do for somebody else. According, to, that's when you ask about Buddha and Buddhism. One thing Buddha says is there's no savior coming. It's hard news. Yeah. Like if you think somebody's coming to save you, um, uh, we we don't believe that. We don't we don't live that way. So the flip side is we believe people have the resources to kind of, um, uh, you could say, quote unquote, save themselves. 
Um, but even then, we don't feel that people are, um, you know, subject to some kind of like horrific, demonic power if they don't find somebody to save them. Yeah. That's a, that's, I, I, I don't mean to offend anybody's view of life, but, um, you know, it seems a little bit um, like a child with waiting for their parents to come home and fix it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So everybody sh can believe whatever they want as far as I'm concerned. I really, I really very, I like to be very tolerant and very curious about what other people are into, but Buddhism is non-theistic. There's nobody coming to save you. Yeah. Powerful, it, right? It really is. I even Buddha, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I even heard that, like, because it isn't necessarily religion, like being a Buddhist could actually make you a better Christian, even. Like you could be like a is that is that a thing? I see you making the face, but <laughs> I, I just feel like you can yeah. apply some of these even if you're not really fully into Buddhism. You know. Well, that... let's be really clear about the delineation points. Anybody can practice mindfulness mm -hmm. and awareness. That has nothing to do with your metaphysical outlook or, or your spiritual tradition. It just mindfulness means paying attention. Anybody can do that, and awareness means noticing what actually happens without bias. So can anybody do that? No kidding. Everybody could. And most spiritual traditions have some version of those those elements. Um, now, beyond that, um, what what is going to benefit you or the situation, uh, then most traditions get into some feeling of interpersonal domain. That's sort of the personal domain. And the interpersonal domain is, for goodness sake, be helpful to others, you know. And in Buddhism, we say, if you can't be helpful to them, at least don't mess them up. Yeah. You know, you know, at least at least be um, considerate. Um, but the, we do have the notion in the Mahayana Buddhism of actually um, uh, being a bodhisattva or being somebody who cares about others. I think that's clearly in the monotheistic traditions. That traditions they have that as well. Yeah. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's that's just you know, basic, uh, good, clear th thought process. So where it, where it becomes that if you can be a Buddhist and not a Christian is if there's a notion of um, salvation right. that would sort of like almost be a delineating point. Yeah. And it's interesting you're saying that because we're having a refuge vow Wednesday and that's sort of a, a deline delineation. You have to really kind of say that you're letting go of that principle in a way that there's some um, external force that's going to have the power to rescue you from your own confusion. We take responsibility for it. Yeah. I think that that's, at least from the people that I talk with, kind of one of the confusing aspects of getting into practices like this, because, um, you know, like one of the, the core tenets of Buddhism is like suffering is a thing, yo. Like you can't really get <laughs> rid of the suffering. Like you can deal with it in better ways, but like still practice, but at the same time, like don't, like there's almost this kind of like hopelessness that I feel like a lot of people find uh, themselves with. And I, uh, I don't really feel it because I feel like this weird sub- um, contextual, like I, I don't question, it, I just practice, but I feel like a lot of people can kind of get in stuck into this rut, you know? Well, you know, uh, it's such a good uh, contemplation because hopelessness is being without hope. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So if you start from the premise that your situation's pathetic and, uh, you know, unworkable, well, then you need hope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you start from the premise that your situation is eminently workable and fundamentally good, you don't really need hope. Whoa. There's nothing to hope. And what Rinpoche used to say is hope and fear always come together. They're like a couple. Mm. So, you know, I hope this, I'm afraid of that. I hope this, I'm afraid of that. So um, if we think of hope as just some kind of positive outlook and, you know, thinking that there's an upside to things, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's a good thing. But if it's something you're clinging to, like a life raft, and, and you never take the time to look and see that it's a life raft, but you're in a bathtub, not an ocean. Mm. You don't need a yeah. life raft. You yeah. need just to be tuned into where you are and what's going on. So I think that despair is the word that I came into my mind when you said hopeless. And people, if they're in despair, I, I think there's a lot of that right now. Um, and that's not the kind of hopelessness we mean, um, that where you have to dwell in despair. 
uh, and a negative kind of feeling. It's just being without the need for confirmation either way of hope or fear. Uh, and just doing away with that paradigm is what we mean by it more. Yeah. Is that you follow of, that logic? Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. So it's kind of like despair is kind of like an active verb, you know, whereas yeah. like hopelessness is, I mean, you don't really have like a need for it, you know. Right. Yeah, I feel completely hopeless right now. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's some authentic <laughs> honesty. That's yeah, No, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm trying to do things in the world, you know that, yeah. and uh, but it's not based on hope. I'm just putting it out there and doing my best. Yeah. And uh, if you can invoke or, or, or invite a positive outcome in your mind that can shape your uh, uh, attitude but uh, I don't think being hopeless means you have a negative attitude necessarily uh, but you also don't have a false positive so you just keep rowing you know in a way in a way you become a great rower if you're not like looking at the target you know mm, mm, I like that a lot yeah I think that that's really useful considering the uh, unique stressors that we're finding upon ourselves in this generation you know I think Mm, I feel for your team and I feel like any kindred spirits we have because your team is exploring uh, in a similar way that my team explored which is you know we don't really want to just buy into the conventional lines around us we want to see for ourselves and um, you know that I have a lot of uh, kindred s spirit with the, with the journey that you, your team is on I, I, I can relate to it I think. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Yeah. Well, I think that's what makes you such an effective communicator of the tradition is because you're actually listening and kind of uh, relating to the fears that my generation is going through. Whereas I feel a lot of folks, they don't really listen or they like try and mm -hmm. like push it to the side, like, oh, just get a job, get a, get your mortgage. And, <laughs> get a job. You know, but, it, but we really are in a completely different world, it feels like often, you know. Oof. Yeah, I, I, I can't, I can only imagine, I, I do like to listen because, you know, views change as to what people think are important, you know, um, and how, how, you know, people define themselves and their, and their, and their group of people. I feel like, you know, each generation has to do that. Mm -hmm. Like that's the grandma's recipe. You can't just imitate the previous generation, but you can take the recipe and say what ap what about it applies to me i had no interest in becoming tibetan for example yeah even, even though it has a sort of cool factor yeah, you know yeah. um you know i just saw immediately okay well if we just take that on and fake that you know fake that we're going to be even further away from who we really are mm -hmm. we're going to be using spiritual materialism that's why i love trungpa rinpoche because he right o right away said cut through that yeah cut through that fascination part of this and get to the real stuff mm. Yeah, and I think that that's what drew me to it. You know, like I had the intention of doing the meditation teacher training, and I've kind of been surfing around these teachings for a bit. But after having taken it, just the like the juiciness of it, you know, it was very mm -hmm. practical, very accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so, would you not consider yourself a Tibetan Buddhist then? I don't. You know, I, I guess um, what I consider myself is. Beyond that, even, is a student of Trungpa Rinpoche, mm. which is, I'm just speaking spontaneously now. Yeah. And as he was a 100% product of Tibetan Buddhism, there's no way. However, in many ways, he transcended that. Um, and also in many ways, he, he was kind of an archetypical American in a way, because he was an immigrant. Mm. He was a first-generation immigrant to this country, and a lot of immigrants, including my grandparents, came here and went like, uh, we got to map it to a new map here. And what's funny about this country, and what I love and hate about this country at the same time, is everybody here is from somewhere else. <laughs> there was a movie called Moscow on the Hudson, Robin Williams, and everybody in New York is from somewhere else. It's just, and it's true. But the people who got here earlier think, well, we're the real Americans. And that makes me mad. I get angry when I see that because I go, no, 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 no. Your grandparents came, or their or their parents came, and everybody, um, you know, faced this transition. And we should be kind uh, to that kind of diversity. It's um, it's we've had a strange history as a country of being extremely welcoming and kind to diversity, and also the w worst track record in the world in some areas about that. Yeah. So yeah, I think Trungpa Rinpoche was a 
um, came to America just like other people have in the past. And he had credentials. You know, some people came from other countries that were doctors and lawyers and they didn't work anymore. You know, like, you know, somebody who was a doctor in Yugoslavia and they come here, they're not a doctor here. Mm -hmm. So he was a great master in Tibet. He was from a really super authentic lineage. And from the very, very young age was relied upon as a, as a leader. But he came here, he had to rebuild it all from the ground up. And you know, he never really, um, he never really complained. Yeah. It was um, it was a, a lesson, you know. Like I sometimes when I start to complain, I really think about him, and I think, no, let's not complain. Yeah, J just lean in a little bit. So I'm very much thinking more than a Tibetan Buddhist. I'm I'm sort of a a student of his in a sort of long arc sense. And he preserved certain aspects of Tibetan culture, and then he moved beyond certain aspects in a very demonstrable way that was at times, uh, you know. Um, maybe not comfortable for some of the classical Tibetan teachers who came. They weren't sure if he was, um, um, you know, truly representing their tradition. Mm. I remember reading, I don't remember where, but it was kind of about how some of his colleagues from Tibet didn't think that the Westerners would be able to actually learn what he was teaching. And he was like one of the few people who actually believed in our capacity to like grok these things. <laughs> like, thank God that he did, you know? Yeah, yeah. He trained his students like serious practitioners. There's no doubt about that. And he left his lineage in our hands. There's no doubt about that. So, um, you know, there's a variance there, but all the young lions of the Tibetan tradition, you know, who are not necessarily mainly raised in, in Tibet um, because they might be in their 50s. So if you think about it, Tibet was invaded in 59. So that's uh, 60 years ago. So some of these people were not even born in Tibet mm -hmm. and, and some were. I'm talking about, you know, um, Zigar Kanto Rinpoche and Tsangsa Kense Rinpoche and Kando Rinpoche. They're all, you know, probably in their... Uh, you know, 50s or so, they revere Trungpa Rinpoche. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn by saying that they really respect him and recognize that he was a, um, you know, a groundbreaker and had a lot of, a lot of um, um, you know, the icebreaker energy. Um, so, and also Trungpa Rinpoche was really confirmed by the two heads of his lineages in front of all of us. He brought the 16th Karmapa, come over the head of the Kagyu lineage, and he empowered him right in front of us. Mm -hmm. And then Dilgo Kensei Rinpoche, who was the head of the Nyingma lineage for a while, and a revered master. And they both, you know, it was significant that they said, look, this is an authentic lineage holder here. You people are lucky. Um, and, you know, maybe you could say that's credentials, but to me that's the right kind of credentials. Right, right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm just kind of curious with your own path as you've interacted with uh, a person such as this, like what was it about like the Rinpoche path that didn't appeal to you? Like, you know, I feel like you had an in, you know, to where you could have probably, if you really wanted to like really step into that, the more monastic order, but it, it seems like you, you preferred to do like the musical route. Like, was that something that um, Trungpa Rinpoche would like, kind of encourage you to keep following your own path or like how did yeah. you decide between the the full teacher musician dichotomy yeah it's a funny thing because i you know lately because i'm you know manifesting more you know i i've been teaching a long long time but a little bit under the radar in terms of trying to let a lot of people know about it you know now we're trying to launch this dharma moon platform that um so that more people can come in and study and practice together and connect online. Um, I, I um, <clears throat> never really felt called to monastic tradition. I think I'm too worldly a person. You know, I I'm really love music. I love food. I love society. You know, uh, I like business. You know, I, I enjoy those things. So Trung Rinpoche, from day one, the first workshop I took with him in 1970, I think it was sort of probably middle winter in 1971 or late fall 1970, was called Work, Sex, and Money. Mm. And it was at a yoga studio. So creativity, spirituality, and making yeah. a buck isn't that far off. And he really strongly, 
strongly presented the view that um, that uh, these practices in everyday life were uh, integrated in his view beyond the uh, notion of trying to um, parse them out again for another 2,000 years. And then he pre presented the Shambhala teachings, which have that real strong message emblazed in it, um, that this is the sacred world. And it, that just resonated with me. I, 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 um, I love hanging out you know, in the monasteries and just the purity of that life and, and, and that approach. It's just, I have a lot of students and if that looks like their karma, I send them to those kind of places, but I don't, I, I'm not the right teacher for them. Mm. But that makes you the right teacher for other folks, you know? So, it, you know, you definitely have a niche, you know, and uh, I think like you really speak to a lot of the folks. I know it came up a lot in the teacher training who came from Duncan Trussell you know, like, I feel like you, you actually are like a really good fit for the, the folks who congregate to that scene. Like it, it is like this doorway, you know, and. Uh, well, they totally remind me of us. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's tripping. Everybody's, you know, looking around. Everybody's um, kind of a little fragile. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everybody's trying to find their way into, in, into or out of whatever the conventional situation is. I couldn't feel more at home. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a magical thing because Duncan and I just sort of you know got um, uh, to be friends really and and you know uh, with him there's a tremendous interest in uh, reality and the mind and and experience and he's also you know somewhat fearless in terms of like not really uh, he he's kind of outrageous in a way which I really like. And so he's a natural, to me, it was a natural hookup between him and me and Trung Rinpoche. It was like um, a, a kind of reunion of sorts. And then, then there's a whole group of people, including yourself, I think, right? That's how you yep. got into it. Yep. And they show up all the time. And Duncan is leading meditations on his podcast now. And a lot of his uh, uh, crew have taken the teacher training. So I feel like we're in sort of a very adjacent uh, um you know spheres and i love him it's as simple as that i actually feel like he's a great person and a really creative person and um you know really honest person and so for me this is you know a um, natural kind of uh, fit you know yeah yeah i think like when i think about people's niche in the human ecosystem you know i think he does a really good job at helping folks who got into spirituality through like psychedelic use he really yeah. appeals to like the magical thinking folks but then he also <laughs> will it, like interweave people who have very very deep practice and very structured ways to navigate and I, you know he's kind of like a like a he's like a relay guy you know he just like is crossing all these different wires yes. for people and yes it's and that takes a certain amount of selflessness to do that yeah it, you know i think he gets that it's not about him yep yeah and I've seen people get that and not get that. You know, I really think Chung Parimche knew it was not about him. Um, and he used to talk about being a grain of sand. Mm. The He said the universal monarch is a grain of sand. There's no self-importance. You, you just see through that layer of like um, um, anybody who's collecting a large platform for themselves. Um, there's a seduction, as you know, you know, to pull it in and go like this must be about me mm -hmm. that there there's you know and somebody says well it's not about you know i'm it's not me i'm not really that self-involved but how'd you like my latest movie you know that joke yeah 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 <laughs> so you know this is um you don't get at selflessness by having uh, a diminished sense of self that's what's interesting about it you have it you get to it by having an appropriate sense of self mm. an accurate sense of self and if there's clarity, you go, self is impermanent, it, it's uh, interdependent, and it doesn't really have the in, independent substance. Mm -hmm. And that's what we mean by egolessness. Not, not that you don't exist, you don't have a car, you don't have a house, that's all, that's silly, yeah. you know. So, um, you know, I think as somebody's mind clears up, it becomes obvious that it's kind of less about them, and they'll feel happier, too. Yeah. If it's about you, you're going to be miserable. It's claustrophobic, right? Like it's, <laughs> Self is totally claustrophobic. Yeah, yeah. yeah like you, That's good, Brett. You don't really it's even really, get to enjoy yeah. the fruits of what you're doing, you know? You're too busy convincing yeah. yourself 
and like that just takes a lot of energy you know it's, yeah you you get tired it's this you know and you can i have in the chapter in my book monitor your energy and if if when you become you know fixated you, your energy starts to drag mm-hmm. and when you you know when you move into the flow of the situation somehow you can ride the energy it's like surfing you yeah. know you don't fight the wave yeah yeah, that's good, Brett. You, you are you teaching now? Are you, have you started classes? So because I ended up moving and I just got back from Florida, I haven't been able to settle into that. But I actually do have a workshop in the works that I'm going to start, um, kind of broadcasting. So yeah, um, yeah. Okay. I was kind of debating on doing like uh, maybe like a daily meditation for uh, like a month long challenge where I do it like live streamed, just to invite people in to just kind of feel the space out. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to see how it works. I'm going to actually meet up with Neil sometime this month, and we're going to go over exactly yeah. how I'm going to roll it out. Um, as a massage Wonderful. therapist, that's been my, you know, my bread and butter. So I'm going to. You know, Trungpa Rinpoche empowered it us. Empowered us. He yeah. did. It was explicit, and I feel like we're empowering you guys. Yeah. That's how it goes. That when you talk about lineage and tradition, that's how it goes. You don't just go like, oh, well, these people couldn't understand this, and you know. Um, so I'm pretty proud of my students, to be honest with you. I really, I feel like um, so far so good in terms of upholding it. All we want to make sure is everybody can go deeper, you know, because yeah. there's so much depth to it. Oh my goodness, you know, mm-hmm. it's like music or anything else like that. It's There's so much depth. So I'm going to really work my ass off for the rest of my life to, to enable uh, people who want to go deeper into these things to have some way to do it. That's That's the... That's the rest of my life. Yeah. Well, I thank you. Uh, I'm sure I'll be plugged in uh, for a lot of that. Um, do you almost feel like you have like a sense of responsibility being one of the the people who actually receive that direct transmission? Are you operating out of responsibility or is it joy or like what motivates you? <laughs> you know, Rinpoche said in his will, in his will, he said, I will haunt you. <laughs> and he, he, it's the most haunting thing about your teacher for me is that they're not completely external to you Mm -hmm. it's easy for a ghost to haunt you and it's like two people but if the ghost is inside you that's a different kind of haunting and and um i also have my sangha i have my dharma brothers and sisters who are there we're getting older you know it's like i'm talking about a bunch of people in their 70s at this point but they're pretty juicy yeah and there is a certain dedication that is um, strong and uh you know to, to carrying forward um, and everybody's looking, you know, to to do their best. So, I guess the conventional notion of retirement, you know, can you imagine the Dalai Lama retiring right. from what to what? You right. Know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I I, I feel like um, it is a certain sense of responsibility that was put out there as such. And at times when Rinpoche was alive, the responsibility was very very um, challenging, because he was going, you, it's you people or it's nothing. Yeah. And that was, you know, um, caused people like me to make decisions in our lives to to sacrifice certain things. Um, you know, I was living in Los Angeles, having hit records, and you know, uh, s- sort of in, in a beautiful house on Mulholland Drive. And he asked me to go be the director of Karma Chilling in Vermont, the meditation center, for twenty five dollars a week. <laughs> oh, jeez! <laughs> With a wife and yeah. a brand new baby. Oh my goodness! Ethan was a baby. So that was hard. Let's not get confused about this. This is not a love and light trip in the sense of like, oh, Guruji was so nice. You know, I mean, Guruji's going to kick your ass. Yeah. <laughs> Whether they do it literally or not, it's like you're getting trained. Yeah. And so, um, you know, anybody who's had any kind of real training, you know, it's not all into your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So uh, at the end of the day, though, um, um, you know, mm, the kind of uh, sense of appreciation is is overwhelming actually at times just that um, that we had such good fortune and and that includes him working himself to death basically is what I saw just never you know when we talk about leaving it on the field he never really thought about himself wow he never thought about himself and and um, and then he introduced us to the whole gang so the fact that I got to meet the 16th Karmapa Dujem Rinpoche, Kalu Rinpoche, uh, you know, uh, Dilgo Kense Rinpoche. Those were the blues masters, yeah, Brett. Yeah. 
that was you don't have that anymore and, and it was only through Trungpa Rinpoche's extreme effort you know before Karmapa came he stayed awake for four days in a row to get the place ready for, because we had no idea right wow so and these these teachers these beings have completely changed my life period mm. and when I think about them I think goodness and I think about compassion and I think about wisdom and um it's no different than visualizing their image in my mind. Yeah. So I I feel like I've met the Buddha in person. That's really a very unique and special uh, feeling. And I'm, you know, doing my best. Yeah. You know, I'm doing my best. Yeah. And sometimes it's not as good as it could be. And sometimes it's like, okay, you you you, you leaned in, mm-hmm. you did it. And then we're all trying to have fun too, right? Yeah. You want to yeah. enjoy your life. And I think I wasn't taught, oh, you can't, you have to be a mo- martyr or something like that. So appreciation, enjoyment, that's part of our culture at Dharma Moon. Yeah. We've got a lot of musicians and talented people. I go like, okay, let's, let's have some celebration too. Yeah. Well, I think that that's what adds to like the longevity of the situation too. That's what keeps you, you know, you're able to work until, you know, the end, you know, that's what you're yeah. saying. If yeah. you weren't able to have that's joy, right. you know, that's that's the fuel. Yeah. I I mean, how old are you, Brett? I'm twenty seven. Wow. Got some yeah, got some years ahead of me. Well Hopefully. you know what's funny is that most of the people I talk to they think they're old already. You don't think that, right? No, no, I, I see exactly where I'm like, Oh, I got I got so much, like I'm not even forty. But you're yet. so wise, Brett. You're so wise for somebody that, that at that point. Um you know, it's very encouraging, and you know, you you just have to know that if you need support for what you're doing, I'm I'm available to help you. Thanks, personally. David. I really appreciate yep. that. Yep. Yeah, I definitely have intentions to keep plugged into the Dharma Moon community. I think uh, it has definitely s- s- spoke to me in a way that nothing else really has. So, yeah, it means a lot. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's so inspiring to hear. Yeah. It's huge. Like it really, you know, we don't have the, the whole gang, you know, this, this generation. So, you know, I, you might not feel it, but I, I wonder if like Trungpa Rinpoche felt the similar things to how you felt. Like I might not be doing enough. I don't know if that was even a part of his, like, you know, his psyche at that point, but he said, I never give up on anybody. And so he said a lot of things to us that were not like the teachings per se. They were pith instructions. Mm. But and but you, they were ear whispered. He said them right to you. It wasn't like you're reading it from a book. Yeah. I never give up on anybody. Wow. And I thought like, whoa. So if somebody annoys you a little bit or you think, oh, they're kind of slow or they're kind of thick or they're kind of arrogant, what a simplification to just go, okay, that's the ground. Um and it helps me to to align my attitude with something that doesn't make me feel split up and tormented by by being with people. I look at them and say, "Okay, this is great. This is inspiring." And the more they lean in, I think that's true for any teacher. When the students lean in, the teacher's life is extended. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of things in the Tibetan tradition where they say you can extend your teacher's life, but the main way you can do it is by leaning in and and um, making their life uh, feel connected uh and then longevity longevity is a different game because longevity is usually mixed with uh you know one's own sense of self-protection mm-hmm. but i have a longevity tradition that i study also so i have a Taoist tradition that i study mm-hmm. so i'm torn between leaving it on the field and like just making sure you just conserve a little bit yeah <laughs> so that you can extend the experience yeah it's a funny, I have two teachers, a short-jevity and a longevity teacher. You know? <laughs> I and like My that. longevity teacher is Sat Han, who's a, a, a Taoist teacher in New York and Qigong and Tai Chi master. So those are my two main teachers in this lifetime. Mm. Yeah, my last roommate was actually really into Taoism and did Tai Chi. And we'd always kind of go back and forth on the benefits of Buddhism and then Taoism and is if there was a joke about a Buddhist and a Taoist walking into a bar, you know, that would have been... <laughs> oh, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Yeah, fun. you know, the Taoists protected the Buddhists at some points in history. And, you know, maybe in China it might have been a little harder to distinguish um, because these are just labels. But definitely the notion of uh, immortality or long life, you know, there's some very old people on this planet that nobody knows about. Yeah. 
yeah like older than guinness book of records right and there are ways to kind of extend your life and preserve it and take good care of it and um you know but the buddhism the bodhisattva thing is you're really surrendering any sense of self-preservation um so it's an interesting combo platter yeah Uh, Yeah. i figure if i can stay healthy and well i can i can um contribute more yeah i think that that's kind of that's part of the bodhisattva thing too right you got to kind of be able to help people (laughs) you know if you can maximize the goodness then you know that's okay but that is our time david uh yeah thank you so much for joining me this has been a real honor and treat well and bet for me just to get to know you a little better that's really good so um i hope that we have a chance to talk more about these things and and um i really um i respect the fact that you're trying to put this out into the world and um so whatever help Dharma Moon can be to to what what you're trying to do, um, you know, I think I think it's um, you're you're so you're so nicely grounded, Brett. You know, it's um, you're you're a very reasonable person, and a very decent person, and um, this was fun for me. Awesome, I'm glad to hear it. That's what yeah. I look out to do. So, thank yeah. you so much for joining me. Okay, all the best. You as well. All right, my friends, that was the episode. Thank you so much for listening all the way till the end. I truly do make this show for you. I will say it until the day I die. It means a lot to me that you gave this much of your energy to this platform. And I will continue on building the best possible show for you. Got a lot in the works, like I said, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, David does have uh, another mindfulness meditation teacher training course coming up. Starts April 9th that weekend. So if you wanted to get signed up for that, um, you can head on over to to tibethouse.us and there on their event calendar that will get you plugged in. Hope you all enjoyed the episode. Please tune in next week at 11 a.m. Wednesday uh, for another exciting conversation on the frontiers of cultivating vitality. All right, have a good week, y'all.